Uh, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our Crossref Live um, webinar series this week. So this is our first day today. Um, I'm just going to give you a few minutes to let everybody join and to just say a few words of welcome. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, today we're going to have um, a talk by uh, Dr. Lukman about the future of Indonesian journal policy. And then we will have a talk by myself and my colleague Rachel Lamy from Crossref. And we will talk about an introduction to Crossref and the work that Crossref does for the benefit of scholarly community. Over the next two days, we will have um, two more webinars. So tomorrow we'll have a talk by uh, Dr. Despata Erwin uh, Irawan from the Open Science Community Indonesia, who will talk about the urgency of accurate, comprehensive metadata, followed by a talk by myself and Amanda Bartel about how to register your content at Crossref. And then on our final day on Thursday, we'll be joined by uh, Dr. Mohamed uh, Sayaref Bando, head of Indonesia National Library and representative of Indonesia OneSearch platform. And they will talk about OneSearch and the upcoming project of the Indonesia National Library. This will be followed by a presentation by Crossref staff about the uses and value of Crossref metadata. So we hope you find these talks interesting and useful. You may have signed up for all of them. You may have just chosen to attend today or today and one other session, um, but we hope that you find them useful. We will make sure that all the presentations are shared um, and the recordings are made available uh, for you to watch in your own time afterwards and for anyone who is unable to join us today. Uh, we'd like to thank Relawan Journal for collaborating with us on this webinar series and to all of our guest speakers and also our ambassadors for helping to put this all together. So I'm now going to hand over to our moderator for today, uh, who is Azar, and, and he will talk us through the next steps. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa, I couldn't switch on my video. Oh, uh, let me help you with that. You should be able to do it now. Okay, baik. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, UK time, and good afternoon, Indonesian time. Selamat sore, Bapak Ibu, uh, yang telah berhadir pada kegiatan uh, the fourth annual meeting of Crossref and Relawan Jurnal Indonesia. Uh, pada hari ini, <coughs> pemateri kita telah hadir di tengah-tengah kita, yaitu Bapak Dr. Lukman yang semua pastinya Bapak Ibu pengelola jurnal sudah mengenal siapa beliau. Ya, tetapi izinkan saya membacakan sedikit profil beliau. Beliau adalah Dr. Lukman, pakar publikasi atau jurnal ilmiah Kementeri Tekbrin yang juga sekarang sebagai sekretaris LL Dikti wilayah 6. Beliau adalah doktor ilmu komputer dari Universitas Indonesia Magister Ilmu Informasi dan Perpustakaan dari Universitas Indonesia, Teknik Kimia dari Universitas Diponegoro, Kimia Industri dari Universitas Pajajaran, dan beliau sekarang menjabat sebagai Sekretaris LL Dikti Wilayah 6 di Jawa Tengah. <tuh> Selain itu, beliau juga memiliki uh, tiga IPR. Uh, kalau kita lihat di profil Sinta, kita bisa lihat kalau Pak Ibu atau uh, ISJD beliau adalah salah satu uh, develop, uh, engineer ya uh, developer salah satu uh, yang membuatnya uh, tanpa memperpanjang kalam mari kita sambut uh, Dr Lukman Pak Lukman please welcome terima kasih Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, selamat sore salam sejahtera kita semua Good afternoon, Panesha and Miss Rahel. Uh, today, I will present about the Indonesian scientific journal policy. It's uh, very dynamically uh, about the government and ministry who handle the scientific journal in Indonesia. I will, de uh, sorry for Panesha and Rahel, I will deliver in uh, Bahasa. Uh, 
Baik, uh, Bapak Ibu tadi sudah diperkenalkan oleh Pak Azhar uh, bahwa saat ini saya sa, uh, menjabat resmi sebagai sekretaris Lembaga Layanan Pendidikan Tinggi di wilayah 6 Jawa Tengah. Uh, dan untuk di jurnal ini saya hanya memposisikan sebagai pakar uh, publikasi dan jurnal. Kalau dulu, uh, persis ini satu tahun yang lalu, uh, sebelumnya dari tahun 2008 sampai 2020, saya memang memegang Uh, tanggung jawab terkait dengan jurnal ilmiah dan terakhir saya sebagai kasubit fasilitasi jurnal ilmiah yang bertanggung jawab akan akreditasi dan memfasilitasi semua jurnal-jurnal uh, di Indonesia sehingga bisa di uh, apa terakreditasi nasional sehingga bisa terindeks di uh, Scopus itu adalah uh, tanggung jawab saya tapi saat ini saya di tanggung jawab adalah bagaimana bukan hanya jurnal tapi dari hulu ke hilirnya itu bertanggung jawab untuk mendampingi perguruan tinggi di Jawa Tengah kurang lebih ada 237 perguruan tinggi dengan 350 ribu mahasiswa dengan 14 ribu dosen dari mulai kelembagaan pendirian kelulusan mahasiswa kenaikan jabatan jadi bukan hanya jurnal tapi seluruh aspek tapi yang saya dampingi adalah hanya wilayah kecil di Jawa Tengah namun sampai saat ini meskipun satu tahun sudah saya berada di Semarang tapi saya tetap masih mendampingi Bapak Ibu memperhatikan perkembangan-perkembangan terkini, isu-isu terkini terkait dengan uh, jurnal ilmiah karena ini sudah menjadi uh, passion uh, di bidang saya dan saya sampai saat ini alhamdulillah belum meninggalkan uh, apa namanya perhatian saya terkait dengan jurnal ilmiah yang ada di Indonesia. Bapak Ibu pada kesempatan uh, siang hari ini saya hanya ingin menyampaikan terkait dengan progres pelapor, uh, ke Bapak Ibu perkembangan jurnal kita di Indonesia yang memang menggembirakan, termasuk saya juga ingin menyampaikan beberapa hal terkait dengan kebijakan saat ini perubahan institusi pengelola uh, akreditasi jurnal ilmiah dan yang bertanggung jawab jurnal ilmiah di Indonesia itu nanti saya akan sampaikan di akhir termasuk juga poin-poin uh, penting ketika Bapak Ibu akan akreditasi jurnal ilmiah. Uh, Bapak Ibu, saya mengawali pertemuan ini dengan memberikan laporan ke Bapak Ibu terkait dengan Uh, apa namanya terkait dengan perkembangan penggunaan OJS di Indonesia. Saya saat uh, mengawali dulu sebagai OJS Project Manager di Indonesia yang bertanggung jawab untuk uh, menerjemahkan semua. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, Oke. Okay. Uh, jadi saya pertama kali di Indonesia sebagai OJS Project Manager yang ada di Indonesia bertugas untuk melakukan sosialisasi, kemudian melakukan transaksi terkait dengan OJS. Dan saat ini sudah ada OJS 3. Kalau Bapak Ibu lihat, ini yang terdaftar resmi di OJS, saat ini sudah ada kurang lebih 26.689 pengguna OJS aktif yang terdaftar. Yang lebih, tidak terdaftar lebih banyak lagi. Dari 26.689, yang menggunakan OJS versi 3 ada 18.217 dan yang menggunakan OJS versi 2 ada kurang lebih 8.472. Dan untuk di Indonesia sendiri Bapak Ibu luar biasa powerful adalah pengguna OJS kurang lebih saat ini 11.613. Itu bayangkan Bapak Ibu 26.000 11.000 hampir 50%, 40% lebih adalah penggunanya dari dari Indonesia. Dan saat ini di Indonesia ini OJS 2 digunakan 6.142, sementara OJS 3 digunakan 5.471. Ini adalah pengguna OJS di eh, seluruh Indonesia. Nah, Bapak Ibu bisa melihat di sini sebarannya lumayan merata ya pengguna OJS ini. Jadi kalau melihat detail per negara, Indonesia luar biasa adalah nomor satu di seluruh dunia, Bapak Ibu jauh mengalahkan Brazil, mengalahkan Amerika Serikat, mengalahkan India, Spanyol, Kolombia, Argentina dan semuanya. Jadi Indonesia adalah pengguna OJS yang paling besar. Maknanya adalah apa? Maknanya di sini adalah kebangkitan jurnal ilmiah Indonesia. Saya ingat sekali 2008 ketika saya mengenal jurnal, itu jurnal elektronik belum ada OJS, tidak ada orang juga tidak dikenal kita di seluruh internasional. Tapi begitu sudah menggunakan namanya Open Journal System, kenapa menggunakan Open Journal System? Karena OJS ini adalah gratis. Dan ini pengembangnya dari seluruh dunia dan Bapak Ibu bisa customize semuanya. Dan sehingga waktu itu kita mengambil kebijakan, kenapa OJS? 
Karena OJS mudah dikembangkan, pengembangnya banyak, platformnya itu dinamis, dan Alhamdulillah sampai saat ini kita pengguna terbesar di seluruh dunia, dan kita memang mendapat apresiasi dari teman-teman di OJS bahwa OJS kita memang powerful, dan kita sudah banyak plugin-plugin baru yang memang dikembangkan terus teman-teman di Indonesia. Memang saya permohonan maaf adalah saya sebagai OJS Project Manager di Indonesia tidak mengembangkan lagi translasinya, tidak mensosialisasikan secara masif karena kesibukan saya saat ini menjabat. Kalau dulu waktu itu saya hanya di eh, apa di PDI Lipi ada tim memang khusus dan setelah saya ke Riste, ke Dikti, kemudian saat ini ke Dikbud, ini eh, kesibukan saya bukan tapi saya sampai saat ini tidak meninggalkan kesibukan saya tidak meninggalkan pemerhatian saya terhadap perkembangan OJS yang ada di dunia maupun di Indonesia sehingga saya diminta oleh tim OJS sebagai foundernya sebagai pendiri salah satu komite di OJS ini yang teman-teman perlu ketahui meskipun OJS ini volunteer dan yang lainnya tapi alhamdulillah karena komitmen kita bersama sampai saat ini pengguna OJS terus dynamic stabil ini adalah saya apresiasi kepada teman-teman terutama RJI yang memang juga turut mensosialisasikan keberadaan OJS, menginisiasi, kemudian membantu teman-teman bagaimana penggunaan ini sehingga bisa diimplementasikan dengan baik. Jadi di internasional tidak ada kewajiban harus menggunakan apa? Harus menggunakan OJS versi berapa dan yang lainnya. Yang ada itu adalah bagaimana secara substansi itu bisa muncul. Nah, OJS adalah salah satu platform yang membantu Bapak Ibu sehingga Bapak Ibu bisa dikenal di dunia internasional. Saya akan memperlihatkan ke Bapak Ibu dampak dari adanya OJS ini yang nanti saya akan sampaikan ke Bapak Ibu. Nah, tadi kalau tadi adalah saya baru bercerita tentang bagaimana mengelola rumahnya, mengelola rumahnya itu adalah menggunakan OJS. Nah, saat ini kalau terkait dengan substansi isinya luar biasa juga di seluruh dunia Indonesia adalah paling banyak Bapak Ibu pendaftar no ISSN di seluruh dunia Indonesia. Sampai saat ini ada 75.000 lebih Bapak Ibu di seluruh dunia itu Indonesia yang paling banyak. Paling banyak daftar dan paling banyak matinya juga. Ini adalah pengguna ISSN terbanyak di seluruh dunia. Nah, sampai saat ini yang terdaftar di PDI Lipi kurang lebih ada 12.000 eh, maksudnya yang sudah online eh, teratur menggunakan platform e-jurnal itu dan terdaftar di Garuda kurang lebih ada 12.246 jurnal. Nah, dari 75.000 yang kelihatan hidup teratur ada 12.246. Yang terdaftar di OJS resmi resmi ada 11.000. Berarti sebetulnya pengguna OJS itu lebih banyak lagi Bapak Ibu. Prediksi saya adalah 30-40% yang tidak terdata lagi. Itu yang lebih banyak. Yang saya sampaikan adalah data yang saya miliki dan terdaftar di database saya. Kemudian dari jumlah 12.246, berapa jumlah yang terakreditasi? Karena memiliki OJS bukanlah kualitas memiliki SSN bukanlah kualitas, terindeks di Garuda juga bukan kualitas, tapi itu baru visibilitas. Bagaimana untuk menentukan kualitas dari jurnal Bapak Ibu? Menentukan kualitas ada pada akreditasi jurnal, ada pada indeksasi yang bereputasi internasional. Yang terdaftar saat ini terakreditasi di Indonesia di, di jurnal ter, terakreditasi adalah hampir 6.000, 5.990 sampai Desember 2020. 2021 belum ada pergerakan. Tapi saya dengan sangat senang hati adalah apa? Senang hatinya pergerakannya jauh ke arah kualitas. Karena apa? Ada e, jurnal masuk peringkat satu yang terindeks kopus kurang lebih 97. Saat ini 95 sudah terindeks kopus, dua belum terindeks kopus tapi masuk ke peringkat satu. Ada kurang lebih e, 909 yang masuk peringkat dua. Padahal dulu ketika Lipi dan Dikti digabung, itu hanya 267 jurnal kita yang memang masuk ke peringkat satu, peringkat dua dulu adalah peringkat A dan peringkat B. Nah, saat ini yang gemuk di peringkat 3 di peringkat 4. Peringkat 5 1500, peringkat 6 229. Maknanya adalah apa? Jurnal Indonesia bukan hanya lagi sekedar terbit menggunakan OJS dan punya ISSN, tapi sudah bergerak kepada arah kualitas yang lebih baik. Nah, ini yang saya ingatkan. Berarti Indonesia ini sekarang sudah maju, Indonesia ini sudah bergerak open access dan bukan hanya open access tapi kepada kualitinya juga memang saat ini terus kita optimalkan. Nah, ini Bapak Ibu, kalau dilihat dari dulu tahun 2007, kenapa? Ini adalah titik balik ketika saya mengenal yang namanya e-jurnal, itu ISSN baru waktu itu 12 ribuan Bapak Ibu. Sekarang sudah hampir 75 ribuan. Bagaimana secara eksponensial kita bergerak secara masif di dunia keilmiahan ini 
mengejar keteringgalan dari dunia internasional. Saya hanya ingin memperlihatkan fakta ini, ingin membangkitkan semangat teman-teman, ayo kita bergerak terus maju, supaya kita ter tidak tertinggal di dunia internasional, dan sudah terbukti, kita mulai uh, leading, meskipun belum pada totali kualitas. Nah, kemudian di sini Bapak-Ibu, ini juga saya memperlihatkan ke Bapak-Ibu, dari tahun 2011 itu hanya ada 11 jurnal terakitasi nasional. Sekarang sudah hampir 6.000, dan bahkan nyaris 7.000 kalau A2020 akreditasi dibuka secara masif, kemudian tahun 2021 dari awal dibuka secara masif, mungkin saat ini prediksi saya kita sudah punya 8 ribuan lebih jurnal terakreditasi nasional. Nah, tapi sampai saat ini baru 5.990 jurnal yang terakreditasi secara nasional. Ini yang saya ingin sampaikan ke uh, Bapak-Ibu semua. Nah, cuman memang sayangnya Bapak-Ibu, saya memperhatikan sekali sebarannya masih berada di Pulau Jawa, masih berada di Pulau Sumatera, Pulau Kalimantan juga masih pulaunya di balik papan di sana, Banjarmasin dan belum terus semuanya di Kalimantan Tengah masih jarang, kemudian di Sulawesi pun juga masih eh, belum banyak, kemudian di Indonesia Timur masih lebih lagi ini. Jadi kita minta tolong teman-teman eh, RJI ya, banyak membantu terutama teman-teman di Indonesia Timur. Bagaimana caranya punya jurnal, setelah punya jurnal, kualitasnya bagaimana caranya supaya bisa diangkat. Karena kita lihat di datanya, di Indonesia Timur, Papua hanya ada 10, Kaltara ada 4, Sulawesi Barat 9, ini yang memang menjadi concern kita bersama. Nah kemudian sampai saat ini, Bapak Ibu kalau dilihat dari usulan akreditasi jurnal, yang belum diproses ada 1.600, berarti 1.700. Tadi ada 6.000, tambah 1.700 kalau masuk semua, Kurang lebih adalah berapa? Kurang lebih ada 7.700. Ada yang ditolak 2.000. Kalau itu masuk semua bisa jadi semua jurnal ya eh, tadi bisa diakreditasi dengan baik. Nah, cuma nanti ada beberapa hal yang ingin sampaikan ke Bapak-Ibu. Eh, kenapa belum terakreditasi eh, sampai saat ini? Tapi paling tidak saya ingin memberikan eh, Bapak-Ibu adalah ini loh eh, faktanya bahwa kita mulai terus bergerak dengan baik, eh, dengan maju terkait dengan eh, jurnal ilmiah yang ada di eh, Indonesia. Nah, Bapak Ibu, tadi saya bercerita tentang di nasional. Saya ingin mengajak Bapak Ibu juga nasionalisme kita kita bangkitkan. Di internasional, alhamdulillah Bapak Ibu saya dulu di 2009 itu sedih sekali ketika saya mengenal yang namanya jurnal ini di Indonesia, melihat di doa aja kita peringkat 66 Bapak Ibu. Ternyata problemnya adalah apa? Problemnya adalah lagi-lagi kita tidak ada visibilitasnya. Bukan orang Indonesia itu tidak hebat tapi karena tidak bisa dikenal sama dunia luar, karena tidak bisa akses masuk Indonesia, karena tidak ada patungnya. Oleh karena itu saya genjot, waktu itu saya menjadi project project manager di Indonesia, supaya apa? Supaya jurnal Indonesia bisa dikenal dengan di online kan menggunakan tadi OJS. Dampaknya adalah apa? Saat ini kita nomor satu di dunia. Sudah 16.575 yang di doa aja, kita sampai hari ini ada 1.850 mengarahkan UK, mengarahkan Brazil, mengarahkan US dan yang lainnya, Bapak Ibu bisa lihat hanya dengan kurun 10 tahun ini Bapak Ibu kita bisa lihat perkembangannya kita dari peringkat 66 langsung ke peringkat 1, tapi ingat DOAJ baru ke open access baru visibilitas tadi, belum pada kualitas kualitas kita lihat ke yang kanan yang kanan ini saat ini hampir 40 ribuan jurnal yang sudah terindeks di fokus, kita baru 95 95 Bapak Ibu hitung dibagi 40 ribu. Ada nggak satu persennya? Ada 0,00 sekian. Silakan saja lah. Kalau melihat dari 40 ribu kita ada 95 agak sedih. Tapi tenang, kita punya bahan baku. Bahan bakunya tadi ada 1850 kalau masuk semua ke Trinex Kopus ya lumayan paling nggak. Nah tinggal bagaimana sekarang kita bisa mengarah kepada kualitas. Nah ini yang kita ingin uh, tekankan ke teman-teman adalah kualitas, kualitas, kualitas. Nah Bapak Ibu, ini saya juga ingin melihatkan perkembangan yang luar biasa. Ternyata teman-teman mampu. Dulu di 2014 ketika saya program internasionalisasi jurnal, hanya ada 15 jurnal. Saat ini sudah alhamdulillah eksponensial 95 jurnal dan saat ini sudah ada 250-an jurnal menunggu di review untuk di accepted atau di rejected oleh pihak Scopus. Sehingga teman-teman tolong bersemangat terus memperbaiki kualitas, kualitas, kualitas. Sekarang bukan saatnya memikirkan rumah OJS, Bukan saatnya memikirkan e-jurnal, tapi bagaimana kualitas jurnal Bapak Ibu dibawa ke tingkat internasional, diterima, terindeks di Scopus. Nah, Bapak Ibu, kalau tadi adalah jurnal kita, sekarang adalah publikasinya. Berarti tulisan-tulisan Bapak Ibu bukan hanya di jurnal kita, tapi di jurnal-jurnal lain yang sudah terindeks Scopus. Kalau Bapak Ibu lihat, Alhamdulillah dulu, 10 dari tahun 2000 sampai 2015 ini kita di bawah Thailand terus sekarang Bapak Ibu eksponensial Malaysia ketinggalan jauh Singapura jauh kemudian negara-negara di ASEAN itu jauh 
dulu mohon maaf dua tahun tiga tahun lalu kita dicibir ya pantasan saja jauh wong kita di proceeding dia di prosedingnya pun juga abal-abal eh tunggu dulu bapak ibu saat ini Indonesia sekarang sudah bangkit bapak ibu kenapa sudah bangkitnya bapak ibu lihat di 2020 artikelnya lebih banyak saat ini artikel di jurnal ilmiahnya dibandingkan di proceeding meskipun baru 2000 tapi itu lumayan kalau tahun-tahun sebelumnya ya 25 persen artikel jurnal sisanya adalah proceeding saat ini artikel karena sudah mulai paham itu di artikel jurnal bahkan artikel jurnalnya sekarang sudah bergerak bukan hanya di artikel terindeks kopus tapi sudah peduli pada yang namanya Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 saya ada uh, datanya sebetulnya Bapak Ibu bisa melihat di mana bisa melihat nanti di Sinta 3 data uh, uh, secara detailnya termasuk juga pergerakannya seperti apa pergerakannya ini saya kasih bocoran meskipun belum di launching namanya Sinta 3 Bapak Ibu nanti ini Bapak Ibu bisa melihat pergerakan apa pergerakan setiap kota setiap wilayah, setiap provinsi, jurnal publikasi yang terindeks kopus di mana yang paling besar, di mana yang paling kecil. Supaya apa? Supaya saya tahu, oh wilayah saya, sudah banyak wilayah saya, masih sedikit, nanti Bapak Ibu bisa melihat jurnal yang terindeks kopus berdasarkan uh, wilayah. Kemudian Bapak Ibu bisa dilihat di sini, dari tahun ke tahun, yang merah ini proceeding Bapak Ibu. Yang hijau ini adalah apa? Jurnal. Berarti dari mulai 2020, 2021 Bapak Ibu lihat, merahnya makin sedikit ya. Berarti tandanya apa? Indonesia sudah berarah ke arah kualitas. Kemudian Bapak Ibu lihat secara kuartil lumayan. Sekarang meskipun paling banyak di Q4, tapi sudah lumayan. Dulu kan eh, apa namanya masih banyak di apa namanya tidak dia tidak dipaham di kuartil berapa. Nah, ini sudah lumayan pergerakannya makin sini. Nah, kemudian ini adalah beberapa hal terkait dengan eh, apa namanya tempat publikasi yang memang saat ini sebagian besar sudah mulai memahami di artikel jurnal ilmiah. Nah, Bapak Ibu, saat ini, nah saya saat ini baru masuk kepada bagaimana kebijakan jurnal ilmiah di Indonesia saat ini. Saya betul-betul mengawali Bapak Ibu ketika akreditasi jurnal ada di DIPI, akreditasi jurnal ada di DIPI dulu masih cetak. Saya angkat tangan, akreditasi cetak saya tidak mau dijadikan asesor, saya tidak mau terlibat karena apa? Waduh, repot sekali mengakreditasi terbitan prosesnya, waduh setiap kali rapat dan yang akhir apa? Kita gabungkan jadi satu. Uh, sebelum digabungkan kita elektronikan dulu itu menggunakan EJS akreditasinya dalam bentuk elektronik meskipun sudah elektronik tapi masing-masing masih punya ego uh, LIPI dan DIKTI kayak nggak apa-apa meskipun instrumennya sama meskipun substansinya sama tapi dua nggak apa-apa tahun 2015 kita reformasi birokrasi dan terlebih lagi adalah RISTEK dan DIKTI itu bergabung akhirnya 2018 kita gabungkan menjadi yang disebut dengan Arjuna akreditasi jurnal nasional ada Permen RISTEK DIKTI nomor 9 tahun 2018 dan kebetulan lahirnya 21 Maret 2018 itu lahirnya Permen Istek Tiki nomor 9 tahun 2018 dan saya per hari itu juga dilantik sebagai Kasubit Fasilitasi Jurnal ini ya. Tugasnya adalah apa? mengawal akreditasi yang baru hasil penggabungan supaya bisa mempadahi bisa memfasilitasi jurnal ini di Indonesia. Waktu awal penggabungan hanya ada 500 jurnal. Saat ini alhamdulillah sudah 5990 jurnal. Ini berjalan terus sampai 2018. Ada di sini. Dan ternyata eh, harus ada pemisahan kembali Bapak Ibu. Dikbud dengan Ristek Brin. Nah, mulai 1 Oktober 2019, eh, akreditasi jurnal itu dari Ristek Dikti beralih ke Ristek Brin. Nah, kemudian Bapak Ibu memahami 2020 itu ada lagi pemisahan lagi fungsi Ristek dari Brin menjadi Dikti. Jadi ke Dikbud Ristek, Kemendikbud Ristek. Nah, di manakah posisi akreditasi jurnal ilmiah? Posisi akreditasi jurnal ilmiah saat ini ada di bawah Direktorat Jenderal Pendidikan Tinggi. Nanti namanya Insya Allah menjadi nama Dirjen Dikti Ristek. Nah, nanti ada direktorat sendiri yang menangani akreditasi jurnal ilmiah, Direktorat Penelitian Pengabdian Masyarakat, sama seperti dulu DRPM. Nah, ini adalah 2021. Sampai saat ini Bapak Ibu mohon bersabar, manajemennya belum terbentuk pejabat siapapun belum terbentuk, tapi Bapak Ibu tidak perlu khawatir sebagai pengelola jurnal. Karena kemarin ada kerisauan, Pak ini bagaimana ini akreditasi? Saya sudah mempersiapkan lama-lama, terus ini gimana sekarang berada di kedikbud risetnya? Tenang Bapak Ibu, yang berubah hanya lembaganya, yang berubah hanya manajemennya. Tapi secara substansi saya ingin memastikan dan meyakinkan kepada Bapak Ibu semua, tidak ada yang berubah terkait dengan akreditasi jurnal ilmiah ini, karena kita sudah mengadopsi ketentuan internasional, baik itu ketentuan dari COPE tentang Komite of Publication Ethics, regulasi terkait dengan akreditasi jurnal ilmiah ini, turunan dari apa? Turunan dari bagaimana akreditasi yang baik, 
berdasarkan yang disebut dengan COPE, Komite on Fabrication Ethics. Sehingga apa Bapak Ibu? Sehingga yang disebut dengan pemeringkatan ini pun juga saya ingin yakinkan ke Bapak Ibu tidak ada yang berubah. Bapak Ibu tidak perlu takut. Sekarang dari Brin pindah ke Dikbudristek tidak ada yang perlu yang takuti. Kemudian secara substansi saya hanya ingin mengingatkan dua hal kata kuncinya ketika Bapak Ibu akan akreditasi. Tolong siapkan isinya, tolong siapkan rumahnya, tolong siapkan bagaimana manajemen pengelolaannya. Nah isinya adalah dilihat dari kualitas publikasi. Yang menentukan adalah apa Bapak Ibu? Yang menentukan adalah ruang lingkupnya Bapak Ibu. Ruang lingkupnya tolong pastikan lebih mengkerucut. Kemudian reference manajemennya, sumbernya sumber primer, referensi acuannya, menggunakan citation style yang terstandar. Kemudian petunjuk penulisan sedetail-detailnya dan dipatuhi secara istiqomah. Kemudian kelembagaannya, mohon editorialnya, reviewernya. Ini yang paling penting adalah kepengelolaan yang baik seperti apa. Yaitu editor dan reviewer harus memiliki rekam jejak publikasi yang baik. Kemudian jangan lupa sekarang era IT itu harus ditunjang oleh tim IT yang sangat kuat. Backupnya tadi kalau menggunakan OJS, jangan lupa mirroringnya. Kemudian efektivitas dari jurnal dilihat dari jumlah kunjungan unik dan dampaknya berdasarkan sitasinya. Yang terakhir adalah dilihat dari bagaimana sustainability oleh pendanaan jurnal di Indonesia. Hampir 90% jurnal di Indonesia diterbitkan perguruan tinggi, 90% non-oriented. Jadi dalam artian non-profit oriented, Bapak-Ibu, jadi tidak komersial seperti di luar negeri, tapi Alhamdulillah kalau komitmen, itu Bapak-Ibu bisa menjalankan dengan baik dan benar, Bapak-Ibu. Nah, Bapak-Ibu, ini saya ingin menyampaikan standar minimum penemunan akreditasi jurnal. Jadi Bapak-Ibu tidak perlu takut, ini rahasianya. Kalau Bapak-Ibu ingin akreditasi yang baik, penuhi saja Poin-poin yang saya sampaikan ini, insya Allah ketika nanti bulan Agustus regulasi sudah keluar, akreditasi sudah dimulai, Bapak-Ibu sudah bersiap, nanti Bapak-Ibu eh, yang belum terakreditasi, insya Allah akan terakreditasi, yang sudah akreditasi akan naik dengan baik. Kalau Bapak-Ibu membaca rahasia ini, silakan implementasikan manajemen jurnal ada 11 poin, kemudian manajemen naskah ada 13 poin. Nanti jabarannya Bapak-Ibu baca di pedoman akreditasi jurnal ilmiah, tidak ada yang berubah, yang berubah cuma dua hal. Satu adalah institusinya pengelolanya menjadi dikbutristek. Yang kedua adalah manajemen pengelolanya, kita belum tahu siapa. Tapi paling tidak secara substansi saya yakinkan tidak ada yang berubah. Karena adopsi kita adalah adopsi internasional. Mungkin itu uh, Bapak Ibu yang uh, bisa uh, saya sampaikan. Karena mohon maaf saya tidak bisa mengikuti lebih lanjut. Kebetulan dalam masa diklat dan hari ini ada uh, penutupan. Nah, saya nanti akan memberikan kesempatan ke Bapak Ibu untuk diskusi dan tanya jawab mungkin maksimal sekitar eh, 15 menit eh, terkait dengan eh, jurnal ilmiah ini. Kurang lebihnya mohon maaf. Bilahi topik walidaya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi. Ya, baik luar biasa tadi Pak Lukman ya, Bapak Ibu yang eh, kita sudah dengarkan sama-sama. Eh, izin saya membacakan beberapa pertanyaan yang di chat dulu untuk Pak Lukman. Nanti kalau ada waktu, masih ada waktu kita berikan yang mau langsung live. Eh, ini ada dari Indriani di Bandar Lampung City. How to prepare well to accredited from Sinta 5 to Sinta 2. Nih, mau naik nih Pak katanya. Yang juga sama pertanyaannya dengan Rod, Roni Rodin. Nama Roni Rodin dari Yayan Curug Bengkulu mau bertanya ke Pak Lukman tentang Scopus. Ketika ingin submit dan publish tulisan di Scopus, bagaimana cara untuk mengetahui bahwa jurnal yang tertulis Scopus itu bukan predator? Terima kasih, Pak. Oke, ya, uh, tadi saya uh, kalau tidak salah yang pertama itu rahasia dari jurnal peringkat 2 ke peringkat 1 ya, Pak Azhar ya? Iya, naik, naik peringkat dari okay. dari A. Baik, dari peringkat tiga ke peringkat dua atau apa? Dari, ini lima kedua, Pak. Mintanya kedua. Oh, lima kedua. Jadi gini, yeah. kalau ingin naik peringkat, Bapak-Ibu jangan tanggung-tanggung. Jadi kalau sekarang ini dari peringkat enam ke peringkat dua, bisa nggak? Bisa. Peringkat empat ke peringkat dua, bisa? Bisa. Nah, bagaimana rahasianya? Saya sudah melihat bahwa jurnal yang ada di Indonesia saat ini, itu saat ini baru dipenuhi dari sisi manajemennya. Belum dipenuhi dari sisi substansinya, terutama artikelnya. Apa yang harus dilakukan? Yang paling penting kata kuncinya untuk bisa masuk ke peringkat dua adalah apa? Masalahnya adalah referensinya. Apakah rujukan yang digunakan sudah mutakhir? Dan dari sumber primer, dari artikel jurnal ilmiah, kemudian dari proceeding, kemudian Bapak-Ibu apakah cara membuat tabel, cara membuat gambar, itu sudah sesuai dengan kaidah. 
dan apakah nyambung antara narasi dengan tabel dengan gambar yang ada di dalamnya. Kemudian citation style, apakah Bapak Ibu sudah konsisten menggunakan Vancouver, menggunakan Harvard, menggunakan Chicago, menggunakan FEA. Nah, ini yang saat ini kalau Bapak Ibu ingin masuk ke peringkat 2 gampang. Caranya bagaimana? Jalan-jalan ke -jalan, uh, jurnal yang memang peringkat 2 dan lihat benchmarking. Bagaimana di bidang saya bahasa Indonesia, di bidang jurnal fisika, oh jurnal-jurnalnya masuk peringkat 2 itu seperti apa sih? Yang disebut dengan selingkungnya, yang disebut dengan tata tulisnya. Filosofinya gampang kalau mau masuk ke peringkat 2 dan termasuk ke terindeks Scopus. Apa filosofinya? Enak dilihat dan enak dibaca sajalah. Apa yang dimaksud dengan enak dilihat? Enak dilihat itu istiqomah konsisten antara artikel satu ke artikel berikutnya, antara nomor satu ke nomor berikutnya, antara volume ke volume berikutnya konsisten. Cara membuat tabel, cara membuat gambar. Ini jangan sampai keterangan tabel ada di atas, keterangan tabel ada di bawah, yang satu di atas, yang satu di bawah, dan tidak nyambung. Nah ini yang saya ingin pastikan kepada Bapak Ibu adalah yang paling penting konsisten. Kemudian ruang lingkup Bapak Ibu, semakin sempit ruang lingkup, itu semakin baik dan mudah diterima di internasional. Dan ini pun juga yang menjadi poin besar ketika Bapak Ibu akreditasi adalah spesifikasi dari ruang lingkupnya secara sempit bisa uh, diterima oleh publik dan jarang sekali. Itu sampai uh, belum ada. Kemudian ruang lingkupnya adalah dua hal terkait dengan substansi. Originality sama novelty-nya. Apakah artikel yang Bapak Ibu tuliskan hanyalah pengulangan-pengulangan ataukah itu betul-betul original dan memang belum ada sama sekali. Nah nanti akan terlihat original atau tidaknya dari mana? Dari jumlah kutipan terhadap artikel jurnal-jurnal tersebut. Nah ini yang saya ingin tekankan ke Bapak Ibu. Kemudian yang kedua, pertanyaan yang kedua, bagaimana tadi terkait dengan masalah predator atau abal-abal? Ya, Bapak benar. Ibu, yang pertama tolong pastikan Bapak Ibu punya database yang disebut dengan database Simago. Nah database Simago itu tapi update-nya sayang sekali hanya 6 bulan sekali. Nah di database Simago itu ada eh, kapan dia masih terbit atau tidak, atau sudah di discontinue. Kemudian yang kedua, yang paling live itu, Scopus mengeluarkan Scopus Source Title List. Nah, apa? Bapak-Ibu di googling aja. Scopus Source Title List. Itu adalah daftar jurnal yang masih ada di Scopus, dan daftar jurnal yang sudah terlempar uh, oleh Scopus, alias di discontinue, alias tidak mematuhi lagi ketentuan uh, best practice yang baik terkait dengan pengelolaan jurnal ilmiah. Mudah sekali Bapak-Ibu, jadi Bapak-Ibu ketikkan saja di Google uh, Scopus Source Title List, nanti akan ada list yang tadi saya sampaikan ada kurang lebih 39 ribu, mana yang masih continue, mana yang sudah di discontinue, mana yang memang K1, K2, K3, K4, Bapak-Ibu bisa dibuka di uh, googling Scopus uh, Source Title List. Itu Pak Azhar. Iya baik, terima kasih. Luar biasa. Uh, ini ada lagi Pak. Cuman kita masih ada waktu dari Pak Niki Rosadi. Bagaimana pandangan Bapak dengan jurnal yang dikelola oleh lembaga independen seperti PT atau CV? Apakah itu sah-sah saja? Mic-nya, Pak. Mic-nya mati, Pak. Hati-hati, uh, ya. Bapak Ibu, dengan kelembagaan. Kelembagaan penerbit itu, itu akan menentukan masa depan jurnal. Saat ini memang di Indonesia sebagian besar ada dikelola oleh perguruan tinggi. Apakah boleh enggak jurnal ini komersial? Di luar negeri 90% komersial. Cuman begitu di Indonesia, begitu dijadikan komersialnya, ini saat ini sebetulnya bukan masalah komersial atau tidak komersial ya. Tapi substansinya, tolong diingat, substansinya yang paling penting. Bukan dikelola oleh komersial dan non-komersial. Tapi substansinya Bukan banyaknya atau sedikitnya jurnal ilmiah yang ada di Indonesia, tapi banyaknya jurnal kita yang memang secara substansi ketika sudah menjadi banyak dan komersial, melupakan sisi substansinya. Yang dikejar adalah tadi, yang penting bayarnya. Yang penting ada amplop di bawah laptopnya. Jadi tidak ada masalah sebetulnya jurnal ini dikelola oleh secara komersial dalam bentuk PT, CV, dan yang lainnya. Tapi... Itu biasanya saat ini dikelola oleh komunitas ilmiah meskipun PT atau CV dan yang lainnya itu hanya sebagai komunitas penyumbang dana. Nah saat ini kami tidak melihat komersial atau tidak komersialnya. Yang kami lihat adalah tadi substansinya yang paling penting. Karena di luar negeri 90% itu perusahaan-perusahaan kok. Tapi kenapa di Indonesia? Itu tapi di Indonesia karena dikelola tidak profesional ketika sudah jadi perusahaan, sudah jadi bisnis, bisnis yang penting uang kualitas nomor keberapa. Itu ya. 
Baik, iya, luar biasa. <laughs> Lanjut lagi, Pak, ya, masih ada waktu. Uh, ini dari Pak Dasapta RW nih, ini materi besok nih. Selamat siang Pak Lukman, kapan pembinaan jurnal melangkah ke arah yang lebih dalam? Bukan hanya masalah akreditasi dan indeksasi. Misal ke arah reusable data sharing. Saya akan sampaikan tentang hal ini besok. Saya Erwin dari ITB. Oke, okay, baik. Terima kasih. Jadi saat ini kita acuan kita adalah terkait dengan pembinaan jurnal, acuan kita adalah kopi. Kemudian terkait dengan penilaian jurnal, acuan kita adalah cuma dua hal tadi saya bilang, secara substansi dan secara manajemen. Yang sekarang berhasil kita perdalam adalah secara manajemen jurnalnya. Secara substansi adalah bagaimana tata kelola jurnal ini dikelola secara eh, baik dan benar. Nah terkait dengan data sharing, kemudian terkait dengan open data dan yang lainnya, ini adalah kebijakan masing-masing pengelola jurnal. Jadi kami eh, terkait dengan tadi eh, open data dan yang lainnya, ini adalah saat ini kebijakan dari masing-masing jurnal. Ada yang memang membuka dan tidak membuka. Dan ini bukan masalah kedalaman. Kalau kedalaman pembinaan di kami adalah kedalaman terkait dengan substansi. Bukan terkait dengan data bagaimana diakses atau tidak diakses. Itu adalah bagaimana, itu adalah terkait dengan manajemen pengelolaan. Jadi saya hanya concern kepada manajemen pengelolaan bagaimana jurnal ini proses editing dan reviewnya apakah sudah terstandar. Itu yang paling penting. Karena menentukan jurnal predator tidak, ya dilihatnya dari situ saja. Kemudian yang kedua adalah ketika substansinya, apakah substansinya ini memang originalitinya ada atau tidak? Novelty-nya ada atau tidak? Kemudian ini memang tidak ada yang disebut dengan pelanggaran etika ilmiah. Seperti itu ya. Baik, terima kasih Pak Nukman. Kita lanjut dari Pak Abdul Ghani Haji, kita masih ada waktu. Abdul Ghani Haji, Abdul Ghani Aceh, Jurnal IPA dan Pembelajaran IPA, GP, terakreditasi Sinta 3 tahun 2019. Apakah sudah bisa disiapkan untuk kenaikan peringkat atau harus menunggu tahun 2023? Oke, baik. Kenapa tahun tahun 2019 jurnal itu bisa naik peringkat ke, secara aturan itu satu nomor? Ya, secara aturan. Kenapa tahun 2020 itu yang naik peringkat mohon di-hold dulu? diprioritaskan bagi jurnal yang baru atau habis masa akreditasinya. Karena jujur saja tahun 2020, BRIN itu waktu saya juga tinggalkan, itu dalam kondisi kesulitan karena kita pandemi semuanya sama sama Bapak-Ibu. 2019 saya dapat anggaran 50 miliar. Itu dari hulu ke hilirnya, langganan akses jurnal, yang namanya langganan Grammarly, langganan semua, itu kita langgankan platformnya, kita pembinaan, kita bakasi jurnal-jurnal itu hibah tata kelola kalau tidak punya anggaran kemudian infrastruktur kita kasih 2019 sebelum pandemi 2020 kena pandemi kebetulan adalah pas semua hampir kolek termasuk keuangan kementerian saya ingat sekali sebelum saya tinggalkan itu hanya ada 2 miliar Bapak Ibu 2 miliar banyak sekali program yang harus dijalankan dan akreditasi itu banyak kan mohon maaf asesor itu lillahi ta'ala dengan padahal banyak jurnal yang harus diakreditasi sehingga adalah apa? Kita hanya memutuskan kebijakan 2020 adalah kebijakannya prioritas yang habis masa akreditasinya atau baru akreditasi. 2022, 2021 saat ini kebijakannya karena ini peralihan dan waktu kita sempit hanya 6 bulan ya efektifnya. Waktu sempit 6 bulan adalah apa? Lagi-lagi kebijakannya prioritas yang akan akreditasi baru dan yang habis. Nah yang naik peringkat nanti mudah-mudahan tetap Bapak Ibu boleh mendaftar. Tapi prioritasnya adalah prioritas terakhir ketika yang baru dan yang sudah habis itu hab, e, tidak ada lagi, barulah yang naik peringkat ini. Jadi mohon maaf, saat ini bukan berarti, wah ini saya e, sudah akan naik peringkat dan yang lainnya. Nah sampai saat ini karena kita jujur saja terbatas dari sisi anggaran, waktu terbatas dan asesor kita pun juga baru e, miliki kurang lebih 500 dan akan ditetapkan. Sehingga masa transisi ini mohon maaf ada keterbatasan terutama jurnal-jurnal yang akan naik e, peringkat. Mohon bersabar, tetap tingkatkan kualitas. Nanti tunggu e, pada waktunya ketika kami sudah e, normal kembali e, di tengah pandemi corona ini, kami akan langsung kebut kembali. Sehingga Bapak-Ibu kami harapkan semua bisa naik kualitas syukur-syukur ke peringkat 2 atau terindeks fokus. Iya, baik. Itu tadi jawaban Pak Lukman. Kita masih ada waktu, e, 4 menit lagi Pak. Ada dari Hamdan Hidayat. Apakah kategori bereputasi internasional itu hanya yang masuk skopus saja? Oke, baik Bapak Ibu. Saat ini kalau dilihat dari regulasi dan aturan, hanya dua reputasi itu macam-macam Pak Azhar. Ada ya. reputasi menengah, reputasi rendah, reputasi eh, tinggi. Nah, reputasi tinggi itu hanya dua yang diakui oleh tim PAK. Reputasi tinggi itu ada jurnal yang terindeks di skopus dan web of science. 
ya Scopus dan Web of Science. Kalau dulu Web of Science itu adalah isi Thomson ya. Thompson. Nah, kenapa harus Scopus dan Web of Science yang memang diakui kalau jadi profesor eh, angka kredit cepat dulu? Karena mereka itu paling tidak sudah menjamin secara kualitas adalah standarnya betul-betul standar tinggi. Meskipun saat ini kan ada jurnal-jurnal predator yang akhirnya dikeluarkan. Tapi paling tidak ketika jurnal sudah masuk Scopus atau Web Science kan masuknya aja ketat. Indonesia aja baru 95 dari 340 ribuan tadi kan. Nah itu berarti sudah ada apa? Sudah ada jaminan kualitas yang memang betul-betul terstandar. Nah Web of Science belum ada satu pun jurnal Indonesia yang masuk ke Web Science for Collection yang ada baru ke yang disebut dengan ISCI, Emerging Source Citation Index. Itu adalah setaranya setara DOAJ. Kalau di tim angka kredit itu terindeks berreputasinya adalah terindeks berreputasi menengah ya. Nah, terindeks berreputasi rendah siapa? Kayak Google, kayak Garuda. Itu karena apa? Yang namanya indeksasi filosofinya adalah sebetulnya eh, apa namanya? tempat jualan lah. Etalase jurnal Bapak Ibu, siapapun bisa. Nah, cuman kenapa rendah? Kalau kita daftar ke Google langsung diterima. Daftar ke Dewa aja ada syarat ketentuan yang harus dipenuhi, tapi nggak sulit-sulit banget. Eh, kemudian daftar ke Mas juga nggak sulit-sulit banget. Tapi begitu daftar ke Scopus dan Web of Science, lebih banyak di-reject dan memang tataran kualitinya betul-betul uh, diperhatikan. Seperti itu Pak Asyar ya. Jadi saat baik. ini kenapa baru Scopus dan Web of Science saja kan? Karena itu yang kami lihat. Iya <tuh> baik. Terakhir, pertanyaan terakhir. Memang waktu kita juga sudah pas ini dua minggu lagi. Dari Pak, Har Pak Hantono. Selamat siang Pak, selamat sehat. Saya Hantono dari Medan. Izin bertanya. Saya reviewer dari sebuah program tinggi yang mengolah jurnal. Apakah SK saya sebagai reviewer bisa diakui saat pengurusan kepangkatan? Terima kasih. Oke, ini sebenarnya menyela, menyimpang, tapi nggak apa-apa. Karena saya juga di sini adalah sebagai ketua tim PAK di eh, Jawa Tengah, itu bisa diakui ya. Eh, untuk tapi dari unsur pengabdian, ya, unsur penunjang itu nanti bisa diakui sebagai penunjang eh, penilaian penunjang ketika diusulkan angka kredit untuk dosen. Jadi jangan khawatir sebagai pengelola sebagai reviewer itu bisa diakui di unsur penunjang bukan unsur yang uh, utama itu sebagai bagian dari uh, apa uh, apresiasi kepada Bapak Ibu yang bertugas sebagai reviewer atau sebagai uh, editor di sebuah jurnal ini mungkin itu Pak Azhar Lubis ya, ya uh, baik. sudah waktunya sudah habis jadi ya. sekali lagi <laughs> saya memberikan closing statement adalah Bapak Ibu uh, sebagai pengelola jurnal ilmiah mohon bersemangat terus dan saat ini uh, di sini nanti RJI mohon terus didampingi jurnal-jurnal. Saya sudah melihat hasilnya banyak jurnal dari yang terindeks apa uh, menggunakan OJS itu salah satu peran dari uh, RJI juga terindeks juga di DOAJ dan saat ini uh, bekerja sama dengan Crossref. Saya ingatkan apa sih fungsinya dari Crossref? Fungsinya adalah sebagai pengenal unik ketika uh, artikel kita hilang. Website kita hilang, salah satu yang bisa menemukan adalah objek identifier. Kita masukkan saja nomor doinya, nanti uh, itu kita anggap sebagai web archiving, sehingga arsip dari setiap artikel kita bisa mudah tertelusur dan ditemukan. Jadi kenapa sih pentingnya doi? Salah satunya adalah untuk menentukan tadi bahwa jurnal kita ini punya nomor unik yang saya analogikan, kalau jurnal itu punya ISSN, kalau makanan di kaleng itu punya barcode, kalau setiap artikel nanti kalau naik pangkat itu di tempat saya sudah diimplementasikan, tidak perlu lagi artikel ini punya Lukman penulisnya judul enggak nomor doinya sajalah supaya tidak tertukar ketika menghitung kutipan atau sitasi. Kurang lebihnya mohon maaf. Bila terima kasih ya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullah wabarakatuh. Ya, yeah, thank you Dr. Lukman yeah. for your saya izin presentation. Iya. Yeah. Yeah. Bapak Lukman terima Mr. kasih. Thank you Miss Vanessa, Miss Rahel. I'm sorry for because I, I go to the other meeting. No problem. Thank no you problem. so much, Dr. Lukman. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now moving to the next session. So the topic is an introduction to uh, Crossref, to DOI. So Vanessa will present the topics. Vanessa, please welcome, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vanessa from Crossref. Thank you. Um, so our presentation will be in English. We'll try to speak quite slowly. And yes. I'm also going to show people how they can turn on closed captions. So if it's easier for you to also read what we're saying, that might help. Uh, so give me one moment, I'll just share my screen.
Okay, are you able to see my screen now? Yes, it is clear now. Perfect, okay. So yes, thank you very much to Dr. Lukman uh, for that talk. It was really interesting. Even though I, I don't speak Bahasa Indonesian, I was uh, translating the questions in the Q&A, so I, I, I get a, a sense of what you were all talking about. So I hope that that was useful for you. Um, so we're now going to give uh, an introduction to Crossref. So we'll talk um, a little bit more about who we are, what our mission is, um, what we mean by a DOI or persistent identifier metadata, and some of the other initiatives that we work with. So my name is Vanessa Fairhurst, and I am Community Engagement Manager at Crossref. And I'm also joined today by Rachel Lamy, uh, who is head of our special programs. So before we get started, uh, just some general information. As I've said, I'm sorry, our presentation today is only available in English. However, if you want to turn on closed captioning to help, you can do so by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen, which says live transcript, and then you can click on view full transcript. This should then come up with some captions along with the video. Um, this may not be perfect, but hopefully it will help you um, to understand what we're saying. Um, if you do have any difficulties um, in understanding, please write some questions um, in the Q&A and we can help to clarify. Um, please do keep your questions to the Q&A box rather than the chat box, just because it's easier for us to manage. And there will be time for us to answer questions live as well, but my colleague Rachel might also be answering some questions in the Q&A while I'm talking and uh, vice versa. While Rachel's talking, I can type some questions and answers as well. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. So we're going to talk briefly about a little bit about Crossref, how to get started as a member of Crossref, persistent identifiers and the importance of metadata, how we work and collaborate with other organizations for the benefit of the scholarly community. And then we'll finish off with where you can find further help and support and a Q&A. So first, a little bit about Crossref. So we're not defined by a particular service. Um, we're not defined by DOIs, but by how we fit into the scholarly community as a whole. And this is our mission. So Crossref makes research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. We're a not-for-profit membership organization that exists to make scholarly communications better. And you, this is our strategy. So we have six goals in our strategy. And we've only just recently extended um, and updated our strategy within the last couple of months. So we created our strategy in 2018 with four original goals. And we have now updated this to add two extra goals. The two new goals are bolster our team and live up to POSI. So I'll just go through what each of these goals means. So bolster our team is all about people, uh, support, culture and resilience, not just because we are coming through a pandemic, but also because we are growing, we need to be able to scale and manage our growth more purposefully with appropriate policies, fees and resources. So this is all about uh, supporting the Crossref team. The second goal, live up to POSI. So POSI are the principles of scholarly, uh, of open scholarly infrastructure. So this is a stated goal because we want to be held publicly accountable to these principles. Um, and they are standards for governance, insurance, and sustainability. So our board formally adopted POSI in November of 2020, and we published a self-assessment soon after this. There are 16 principles that we're going to hold ourselves by, and this goal helps us to keep working towards them, um, as well as maintaining those that we already do. And our four original goals were engaging communities. So this is centered on growth, strengthening our relationship, community facilitation and content. We're soon to have 15,000 active publisher members around the world. And maintaining this growth is a key theme for the coming years. 
In addition, we're working with a number of ambassadors and sponsors, such as Rela One Journal, to help us lower barriers to participation around the world, including supporting languages other than English. And we're increasing our efforts to do more public support via our community forum. We're also expanding the support we offer for research funders and institutions as well. The three final goals. So we have improve our metadata. So this goal involves researching and communi communicating the value of richer, connected and reusable open metadata and making sure that people know how to meet our best practices, making it possible and easier to do this. We'll be talking more about this um, in particular on uh, Thursday. Uh, collaborate and partner. We've always collaborated, uh, but we want to work even more closely with more like-minded organizations to co-create and co-develop and encourage integrations that solve problems for the whole community. And finally, simplify and enrich our services. So this goal is all about focusing. And it's about delivering easy to use tools that are really critically important for our community. So better understanding the needs of our users around the world, and making your experience of working with Crossref simpler by developing tools and support that reduces complexity and helps all of us work better together for the benefit of the scholarly community. So you can read more about all of these um, on our website. Um, however, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the principles of open scholarly infrastructure on the next slide. So the principles of open scholarly infrastructure or POSI for short, outline 16 principles for best practice uh, for running open scholarly infrastructure. And they fall into three categories of governance, sustainability, and insurance. So our current operations already meet most of these principles, but we continue to work towards some of them. And as part of this, uh, we will be doing regular checks on how our operations align with this set of principles. So this year we're working towards reviewing and strengthening our stakeholder governance, making our operations more transparent and making more of our data and code openly available. You can find more information about the principles of open scholarly infrastructure on the website on the slide. And for more information about how we assessed ourselves against POSI, you can read a blog post by our Director of Technology and Research, Jeffrey Builder. And in this blog post, he provides a bit more background on the principles, why they matter to us, and the ways in which we meet these goals and our intention to continue to get better. So a little bit more now about us as an organization and our membership. So we work with a diverse group of members and affiliated organizations, um, over 19,000 now from over 140 countries. So it's a very large membership of Crossref. Um, and the biggest group of our members, about 15,000 of these are publishers. Um, but this also includes a lot of other organizations as well, like funders and repositories, indexing services, data and analytics systems. So our membership is very broad. We now have a metadata store of well over 126 million content items, which is growing every day. And we offer a wide array of services to ensure that scholarly research metadata is registered, linked and distributed. So when members register their content with us, we collect metadata about that piece of content. We process it so that connections can be made between publications, people, organizations and other associated outputs. We preserve all the metadata that we receive for the scholarly record, and we make it available across a range of different interfaces and formats so that the community can use it and build tools with it. So this is a model um, that we have put together to see how our community looks. So in this model, you can see that our community is very diverse and includes not just our publisher members, but many of the organizations and groups that collaborate with us, such as our sponsors, our service providers, our ambassadors, our board of directors, and others. So many people use our metadata via our search interfaces and APIs that the largest group uh, of metadata users encompasses so many different organizations and individuals. And we will talk more about this group in particular and some of the uses of metadata um, in our talk on Thursday.
So a bit more about our membership um, and how it has grown over the years. So at the end of our first year, we had 51 members um, and affiliated organizations. In 2012, we started our sponsoring program and participation in this began to increase. So sponsors like Relawan are affiliated organizations that act on behalf of smaller publishers and societies who wish to register their content with Crossref by providing them with technical and language support and also help with billing and services. So by the end of last year, uh, we had almost 3000 new members and affiliated organizations join in just that 12 month period. So we've moved away from the word publisher to focus more on the word member. Not all of our members self-associate as publishers nowadays. They create and they disseminate content, they deposit metadata with Crossref, and they're able to vote in our board elections. Members pay an annual fee to Crossref, which is based on publishing revenue, and they also pay a deposit fee for all new DOIs or content that is registered. Our first members were from the United States and Western Europe, but today our membership is much more global and diverse. And our membership has grown to, as I said before, uh, more than 19,000 organizations around the world. We have many new members now from Asia Pacific, Eastern Europe and Latin America in particular. Um, and this graph just shows the regions uh, which our new members have come from, uh, from the start of 2018 until the end of last year. Um, and our membership in Indonesia. So Indonesia represents a huge percentage of global membership for Crossref, with about 15% of all of our members coming from Indonesia. So that's more than 2,200 in total. Um, this is mainly universities and societies. Um, and in total, our members, uh, you have registered more than 700,000 content items from Indonesia with us. The majority of the content is journal articles, but that's also a small number of conferences and books. And most of this content is open access. And most of our members in Indonesia also use the OJS publishing platform, which I know uh, Dr. Lukman was just talking about earlier. So why do so many publishers around the world join Crossref? And there, as I said before, there are a largest group of members and they come in all different shapes and sizes uh, from commercial, society, government organizations, universities, and they join to help get their content discovered, to show people where this content is located and to update that if and when this content moves, to drive more traffic to their publications, to turn references into hyperlinks, find out who's using their content, and to participate in some of our other collaborative services. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to join Crossref and how you get started with registering your content. Again, this will be covered in more depth in tomorrow's webinar, but we'll give a brief overview today. So first, I'd just like to point out that we often get asked what's the difference between Crossref and data site and which one to join. So Crossref is not the only DOI registration agency. There are multiple other ones, um, and they tend to serve the needs of different groups. Crossref and Datasite are two of these registration agencies, um, but we tend to overlap more than some of the others in terms of our mission and our communities. We understand that it might be confusing trying to decide who to join or whether to join both organizations, and we want to help this so that you can get the services that best fit your organization and the type of content you want to register. So here are some of the things to think about uh, to help you decide which organization is the right one for you. Um, and this includes the type of content you register, how you publish and the platform that you use. A good general uh, rule of thumb is that if you follow a publishing workflow, so for example, there are editorial processes involved, you select and you steward the content, um, issuing updates like corrections. If this sounds like something that you're doing, then you should explore joining Crossref. However, if you are simply depositing content, um, and this can be different types of research outputs using different kinds of platforms. So for example, researchers who are posting content to an institutional repository, then data site, uh, the data site community might be a better fit for you. 
So as I've said, there are overlaps and our two organizations also collaborate and work together on various initiatives um, to be able to work more effectively. And so if you ever want any information about who you should join, you can always email our membership team and you can also read more about this on our website uh, via the link on the slide. And we're always happy to, to provide advice. So once you've decided that Crossref is the place for you, this is where you would go to join. This is the page on our website, um, which is crossref.org forward slash membership. And there you would submit an application. So the application form will ask for information such as the name of your organization, uh, your organization's website. We need three contact people. So a business contact, a billing contact, and a technical metadata contact. It will also ask you about your fee category and a confirmation that you've read uh, your summary of your obligations as a member. There are also different ways in which you can join Crossref. And one of the main ones of these is to work with a sponsor. Um, so we know that the cost and technical capabilities can be a barrier to participation. And there are some options to enable smaller publishers to member uh, to participate in Crossref, uh, and this includes joining um, as a member via a sponsor. So members who take this option, they have the same obligations and the same benefits as any other member, but they have someone that represents them for Crossref services. So sponsors provide help with registering content, billing, administration, technical and language support, and they pay one annual fee to Crossref, which covers all the organizations that they work with. So you can find a list of sponsors in Indonesia on the slide. Um, some sponsors only work with organizations that are connected to them in some way. So for example, they might be part of the same university or um, consortium or organization uh, that might be using the sponsors publishing platform. Um, and other sponsors are happy to work with a wide variety of publishers in their region. So if you're interested in working with a sponsor, you should contact them directly to explore working together. If you agree to work together, your sponsor would then send you a dedicated link to apply for Crossref membership under their sponsorship. So there's no need to complete the application form on the previous slide if you do uh, use this route instead. So I've mentioned our obligations um, and these are what you commit to when you join Crossref as a member whether you join directly or via a sponsor. So you would need to deposit metadata and create DOI links for your content, maintain and update the metadata if and when changes occur. So for example, if your content moves to a new location, you need to update this with us so that your DOI links still direct the readers to the correct page. You also need to follow DOI display guidelines so always ensuring that the DOI is an actionable link and ensures that it resolves to the landing page where a person can access your content. You need to add DOI links to your reference lists. So undertake reference linking. Um, again, we'll talk more about this uh, tomorrow. And make sure that you pay your invoices on time. So there's an annual membership fee for Crossref dependent on your publishing revenue. For most members, this is the lowest category of $275 per year. And there's also a fee per content item that you register. So for a current journal article, for example, this is $1, but it varies slightly depending on what type of content you're registering and whether this is new or older back file content. And you can find more about our fees on the website. So once we receive and approve your application, you will receive a welcome email from our membership team that contains a lot of information about content registration, including your prefix and your Crossref login, as well as links to access the different content registration tools. You'll also get follow on emails uh, to help you register your content, to help you participate in additional services, and just generally to support you along your journey with Crossref. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we mean by persistent identifiers at Crossref, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with DOIs. Uh, so your prefix is used to create a unique digital object identifier or a DOI for each content item. And a DOI is composed of three sections. So the red part is the resolver address. So each DOI is an identifier, but it's also an actionable link, which means that it is resolvable in a browser. 
And the blue part is the prefix. And this is assigned to each member when they join. And it's always in the format of 10 dot, uh, followed by a series of usually five numbers. In some journals, you might see DOIs with prefixes that only have four uh, numbers after the 10. This is because original prefixes started with four digits, but they have been five since 2012. Um, some members have one publication, some have multiple publications, and um, some members register one type of content, for example, journals, and some publish many different types of content, like books and journals, for example. Um, and you can use your prefix to register all your content. Um, you don't have to have separate prefixes for different types of content. Also, don't get too attached to your prefix. Content sometimes moves from publisher to publisher. Uh, this can be due to mergers or takeovers, and the, the prefix can then move to that publisher. So it is not an identifier of the publisher. It is simply that you are the, um, it simply means that you created the DOI, but not necessarily that you are the current content owner. And the yellow part is the suffix. So this is the part of the DOI that is assigned by the publisher and it's unique to each content item. Our best advice for creating a suffix is that it should be consistent, simple, and short. So it should be consistent and simple for easy management. You might want to establish a pattern that's easy to maintain and short so that they don't take up too much space when it's used in a citation. A suffix doesn't need to state anything about the, uh, the item it's identifying because that's all done within the metadata that you register with us. Um, and when you create your suffix, you might you can use the, uh, the letters A to Z, the numbers zero to nine, and also certain other characters like hyphens or um, parentheses. Some members like to use an ISSN or a volume and issue number. Others like to use a title abbreviation. Whatever pattern works best for you to keep track. Um, but DOIs are opaque identifiers. They don't mean anything in themselves. Um, this is all in the metadata. Um, and please also remember that they are persistent links. So this means that if you want to change the um, suffix at a later date, you cannot do this. Um, so it don't get too attached to a pattern or it having to be perfect. Um, it is just a unique uh, identifier and this needs to always resolve um, to your content. Okay. So once your, con once your content is registered with Koshref, users will be able to retrieve identifiers and start to create links using them. Crossref DOIs must resolve to either the full text if you provide open access or to a landing page that you maintain if this is behind a, a paywall. So the landing page must contain the full bibliographic citation of the article so that the user can verify that they have been delivered to the correct item. The DOI displayed as a URL um, as per our DOI display guidelines um, and instructions on how to access the full text. So as I've said, this might go directly to the open access page. However, if it is behind a login or a subscription, um, you must provide some instructions on how your reader can access the text. So access to the full text is controlled by the publisher, but the landing page must be available to all the readers. Um, and there are many different types of content that you can register with us. Um, so most people know that DOIs are used for journal articles, but Crossref also accepts all the types of content listed here. So each content type has a unique set of metadata and format in our schema. Uh, approximately 75% of our content is journal articles, uh, followed by books, um, about 15% is books. Our newest type is grants, uh, which are still small, but it's a very fast growing area as funders are now starting to join Crossref and registering their grants with us. Um, and Rachel's now going to talk to you a little bit more about ways to register your content and the importance of metadata, along with some of the ways in which we collaborate with others. So I'm gonna pass over to Rachel. Cool, thank you. Um, thank you, Vanessa, and thank you for um, yeah for for inviting us to um, to speak this week. Um, it's it's nice to see some some familiar names. Um, <laughs> the um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, persistent identifiers and the the important to, um, the importance of metadata. So. 
it's always important to understand and remember that that Crossref isn't just about DOIs. Um, and DOIs, they're not an indicator of the quality of the publication or the organization that registers them or a quality of the research presented. It would be, it would be great if it was. Um, but a DOI is it's a persistent link and an identifier for a content item. So we um, at Crossref, we collect lots of different types of metadata. Um, the members provide us with a real range um, for things like information about the publications. And we make this all openly available for thousands of other parties to use in the tools and services that they provide. We have quite um, minimal requirements because, as Vanessa said, we, we need to support a range of publication requirements. Um, basically, we need enough to describe describe in a unique way the content that you're registering. So things like the title, author, publication dates. So anything that says this is the specific article that's different to this one. But we also collect other information about items being registered. So that's things like reference lists, information on who funded the research, ORCID IDs, information on the license that the, the publications are, are using, information about relationships between items, and as Vanessa said, more recently, things like grants. And this week, we will start to accept ROAR IDs, which I'll talk about soon. And there are different ways to, to provide this content to us. Um, you can register content by submitting XML directly. We have a manual web deposit form, which is just cut and paste. But I know um, we know a lot of our, our members in Indonesia will use open journal systems and the, um, the Crossref OJS plugin, um, which, which I guess is a mixture of, of manual and automatic. Um, but we find that that really helps um, the, that really helps people participate in the, the service, um, which is great. Um, there's also more work to come with PKP, and I'll talk about that too. Um, some of you may notice that um, we had a tool called Metadata Manager, which is now missing from the list. Um, the tool has been in, in beta since it was released, and being totally honest, we, we've had lots of problems with it. It's been difficult for people to use and it has limitations. You can only register journals with it and um, people keep getting stuck and our support team need to, to, to spend a lot of time to help them out. So that's why we're recommending these other three methods but with the promise that we'll also provide a new simple interface towards the end of this year for members to, to register content with us. Um, it's also important in that new tool that we can support different languages. So I saw a question about being able to register content in Indonesian. So having interfaces that support um, different languages um, and are easily understandable for, for anyone is, is key to, to that work. So when we start to share information about that, we would, we would love your feedback um, and stay tuned. We will, we will have more information out about that in the near future. So looking at these in more detail, all of the information that ends up in our system is ultimately in XML format. Um, and we have our own schema for collecting information on publications. And having a standard way to do that means that it's easier for tools and services that want to search across the information of tens of thousands of publications to be able to find that in a standard way. So that's why sometimes it can be frustrating when something doesn't quite fit or you get an error. Um, and it's just part of the processes that we need to follow to make sure that the, the information can be captured in a way that then makes it usable to, to anyone who's interested. Um, 
some members register their content by creating their own XML using our schema um, and uploading the file to the system. But the reason that we, we work with tools like the web deposit form and OJS is so that the, meta, the, the XML creation can happen pretty automatically without you having to think too much about it, which for me, that's, that's, that's what I prefer as well. So we know that a lot of our members um, don't have tools that can generate their own XML. So one alternative option is this manual entry form, which we call the web deposit form. It's very basic. You enter your the publication information field by field, and it writes and submits XML for processing in our systems. You can use this form not just for journals, but for books, conference proceedings and reports, and you don't need to use no, any XML to use this form. And it can also be used for depositing additional metadata, so adding that into existing records, for things like funding and license information that can just be uploaded using a, a CSV file. I said that I would talk more about OJS Crossref integrations, and you can see that there are a lot of these and that this list is growing over time. Um, there is a plugin that's been built by PKP in collaboration with Crossref to help members using their, their, their content with us. Um, our recommendation would be that um, would be using at least OJS 3.1.2 to, to support these, these different plugins. Again, I know it can be um, a headache to, to upgrade, um, but I think that um, we want to make sure that, the, um, that we're able to um, devote our resources um, to, to supporting the, the most recent versions. Um, in addition to just the, the content registration, um, we've got several other plugins on the slides that are also available, such as support for reference linking, so you can deposit and link your references using OJS, similarity check, and the funder registry. So th these vary by version, which helps make sure that it's up to date. And we are continually working with um, PKP to improve the overall level of support provided within OJS. Um, there's a question about um, the plugin for um, for OMP. So we're we're um, Open Monograph Press is the book publication platform from um, from PKP, and they also have open um, open preprint services. We're looking at making sure that the the plugin for um, the plugin for open journal systems is also um, usable in the same way and compatible with OMP and OPS. Um, there are Crossref plugins for those, but they're not the kind of officially supported ones. So we want to make sure that there's consistency across the three PKP platforms. So that that is a work in progress, but it's it is moving along and um, to better support that. Um, and we will we will do a video recording. Um, for the sake of today's meeting, we're just going to talk about the the content registration DOI plugin. But as I said, we we want to to put all of the Crossref plugins for OJS into one place so that they're easy to find and use consistently. And this all helps with um, our aims of making metadata accurate, complete, and up to date. Um, if it's incorrect it makes it really difficult to find your publications online and that feeds into the performance of other services that are finding your information and including things like all of the authors on the publication so that they can all get credit for the research that they've contributed to um, and if there are changes so um, say you you move your publication to um, to a new URL 
then you can contact our support team and work with us to update that so that anyone clicking on the DOI will always be taken to your publications in their current location on the web. Um, and we don't just say this, you know, to, to be a teacher or to be, you know, to, um, to give you work to do. The reason is that your metadata goes to lots of places after you register it with Crossref. Um, and there are so many other organizations that use that metadata to find the content that you publish. And you can see some of those on the slide. Um, services like author profiling tools, manuscript tracking systems, library discovery services, metrics providers, and more. Getting a DOI as we talked about, it doesn't guarantee that your content will be indexed in other databases um, because it's not sort of a, a mark of quality, but it does mean that the, the thousands of other tools and services that use Crossref metadata have the opportunity to be able to find it and use it, um, which, is, which is really important. If it's not with us, then it, it can't get to those other places. And as I said, the, I think um, these are really the key reasons that someone would search for metadata and the, the many uses for it. Um, discoverability, so helping researchers, organizations who use Crossref to build tools and services for the research community. Um, it can help determine the integrity of the research. So it won't go into the, the quality of the research itself, but you can see things like who funded the research, what are the affiliations of the, the authors, so helping you make sort of better judgments about the, the relationship of that research to who funded it and who produced it. Um, it's key that researchers can build upon others' work, so being able to verify and reproduce the work is helped by information to, on funding, related data, and peer reviews to give you um, to give you a complete picture of the work, and more and more people are interested in being able to report and assess the um, the the research that's produced by an institution or a funder or a country, and so um, so we can we can help with that. We also provide other services um, I, that we'll talk about sort of later in the week. Um, but these are specific to Crossref and the aim is to benefit our members and the wider community. So things like being able to have an open registry of who funded the research. Um, Crossmark, which provides updates on corrections and retractions to the research. Similarity check, which helps people check for um, the originality of the research. So we're continuing to build on these to make sure that the things that, um, that our members need to support their publications are, are supported within Crossref. And you can see that OJS supports a lot of these and, and there are more to come. And I'll finish by, I'm going to talk about um, briefly some of the community initiatives that we're involved with at, at Crossref. And I've talked a little bit about um, PKP already, um, but we've been collaborating for, for several years and that has included the development of the plugins, um, but also with PKP being part of our sponsor program as well. Um, we have regular working group calls between our organizations and have a memorandum of understanding to formalize our partnership. Um, and that's um, helped us produce um, a statement of work for the continued development of the plugin. Um, so what that means is that we can, as Crossref, we can fund um, development of the, the OJS plugin to make sure that um, that, that work is, is prioritized for our members. Um, we'll soon be adding a plugin for our cited by service. And um, we're just working on some documentation um, to accompany that um, to help people um, know how it works. And we also have planned 
um, plan to um, to develop a plugin for the Crossmark service, um, hopefully by the end of this year, but but maybe early next year. Um, and I've linked to information on the OJS version 3.4 release, um, which again is just going to improve the, the basic information um, or the basic plugin to make that easier for people to use. So more information on that will come soon. We've also just signed a memorandum of understanding with DOIJ. Again, I know a lot of you are very familiar with, um, with DOIJ. Um, the Directory of Open Access Journals, we have lots of overlap between our members and also lots of gaps, things that we could do better. So we plan to work more closely on data analysis, outreach and use of each other's um, use of information to identify countries that need more support, organisations who are struggling to, to become members, um, and we want to just lower barriers to participation. Um, as, as Lars, who's the managing director of DOIJ, says, we want to encourage an open, fair and fully inclusive future for, for scholarly publishing. And we're both small organisations, so we think that together by collaborating, we can do more to do that than each trying to trying to work separately. Um, I've talked a little bit about ROAR or the Research Organisation Registry. Again, Crossref is one of the organisations that is steering that along with California Digital Library and data sites. Um, and you can read more at um, ROAR.org, but you can see that ROAR is an open registry of identifiers um, for research institutions all around the world. Um, I searched for one of the, the universities in, um, in Indonesia earlier this week, and certainly there are a lot, um, there are a lot in there. Um, but the reason for this is um, there's increased, um, I guess, kind of increased um, scrutiny or increased need um, to know which organisations are affiliated with which research outputs and to be able to find a way to search for those in, a, um, in, a, in an open way across millions of, millions of publications. Um, Roar's focus is to create an open registry of the information, specifically focused on research affiliations. At the moment, there are over 98,000 organisations listed in the registry, but this is growing all the time. Um, it's focused on organisations that conduct research, so not trying to identify, say, all legal ent entities. Um, but we are working to allow more granular options to interoperate with the registry. So say university departments is one that comes up a lot. Um, OJS is going to support the collection and registration of um, rural identifiers into the Crossref metadata. And we'll also start to support this in our Crossref schema so that members can send it to us. And we'll make an announcement in the next few weeks on that. We're just, we're, we're doing the final checks in our systems to make sure that, that that's all set up okay. Um, we're also involved in other initiatives that support metadata and making that connection between metadata to research and the research, I guess research is focused to, to help society. Um, so, if you're interested in that aspect of, um, of metadata and, and research, um, there's an updated Metadata 2020 website um, that's organized around the, um, the United Nations sustain, um, Sustainable Development Goals. So to summarize some of the, the introductory um, elements that we've talked about today, um, as I said, I, we often see um, Crossref referred to as a PID or a persistent identifier pro provider. And as Vanessa was saying, um, really what we want to do is support um, scholarly infrastructure. We don't, we don't just want to, we, we don't want to sell DOIs. And um, that's, that's really not the full story of what we do. 
Um, and that's why we provide um, different specific services for, for our community. Things around storing the metadata, providing identifiers, and also links between different types of research. So being able to link data with publications, with preprints, just to build a full publication of, of what's happening in, in research. Um, we, um, we identify citations, so grants, preprints, articles, so lots of different things, and that's growing all the time. And it's key for us that the information is openly available. So we have open data and APIs and um, bulk downloads of that data for, for anyone, to be, anyone to be able to use, and we'd encourage people to do so. Um, so there's a lot going on um, and we want to we want to improve on on what we're doing um, and, and we re we're reliant on our community to advise us on that. Um, we want to provide open, sustainable scholarly infrastructure. So we want people to trust that we'll be around for, for the long term, but also that the information is open. So say we're, we're not around in future, that information is, is, all, is all available. Um, we want to be able to create those relationships that are available via, between research via human interfaces, so search tools, but also so that they're readable by machine. So as the, the volume of research increases and the types of research increase, we want people to be able to find those links and, and work with them. And we want to make sure that our governance, so the people that we report to and who steer us are reflective of the community that we work with. And um, so that's something that, um, again, it would be, it would be great. It's great to have ambassadors in, in Indonesia and sponsors, and we hope that, um, that that will be reflected in the governance of our organization um, going forward as well. In terms of things that we're working on, we've got a public roadmap so you can see what we're working on, what's next, and our ideas for the future. Um, it's our first public roadmap, and it will change frequently. Um, but again, please, have a look, comment, let us know what's um, what's on your agenda. And also you're you're not on your own. It's great that we have sponsors um, who can help to answer answer questions um, and and support us in um, in providing webinars like this. Um, but we also have in an in-house support team. Um, some of, I think Paul will participate in a webinar later this week. So again, you can get in touch. We have an open community forum as well, where you can, you can discuss things. And I said, um, to, to finish, obviously, um, I know that there are more seminars later this week. Um, and um, Dr. DeSafto will be talking about the urgency of accurate and comprehensive metadata followed by a talk by the Crossref team on how to register content and deposit good quality metadata. So hopefully those will um, be, be really complementary to, um, to what we've been talking about today. Um, so I wanted to say thank you on behalf of the Crossref team and specifically on behalf of Vanessa and myself. Um, and we're happy to answer any remaining questions in the time we have left before ending the webinar. So thank you again. Okay, thank you, Rachel and Vanessa from Crossref. Uh, I have a question from Anastasia. So she is from the University of Atmajaya, Indonesia. So they have a change in the management uh, in, the, in their library. And they are, they are a Crossref member and they have a change in management. So should they contact you? If so, what is the email or the contact? So the the best people to um, the best people to contact um, are our support team, and I will pop their um, I will pop their email in. Uh, okay. Actually, it might be thinking about it. So the best people. So in terms of um, changes in 
your affiliations, um, changes in maybe who who manages the the do the DOIs for your organization and the the content. Um, our membership team are are good to be able to help with that. It might be that you don't need. Um, it's often that you don't need a new DOI prefix to yes. reflect changes, um, but maybe we need to change who the contacts are, what the name of your organisation is, or who is able to manage the content. So once your DOIs have a specific prefix we and, and have DOI um, um, identifiers added, allocated to that content. We don't like to change that because they're persistent identifiers, but we can change behind the scenes who's able to manage that, make changes going forward. So our membership team are really well placed to advise on the best um, the best solution for your organization. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Okay. Uh, Vanessa, is there, is, is there anything to say? Um, not anything more to add to that question okay. in particular now. Um, I can, are there any other questions before? I've got some more information at the end, but we can take some more questions first if there are any. So, Rachel, you promised that OGS 3.4 will be launched at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> that's so that's um pkp's most recent um their most recent blog um said that that would hopefully sort of quarter three or quarter four this year um so we're we're hopeful for that and we want to which i thought was like a long time in the future and now we're halfway through the year um but the work on the plugin we've seen a demonstration it's nearly done but we need to provide documentation to support that and we'd like to do some outreach with OJS to support the um you know things like the new layout or any new functionality that exists within the plugin um because we i think i think the key things are that we we want to help make it um make it more intuitive with people i find that within OJS it gives me lots of options so I could prep, choose this option or this option or this option. What's the best one for me? So I think that we can basically, I think we can make it simpler yeah. and help direct people towards what is the best practice to make sure that their DOIs are registered once, registered correctly, and that they're clear on, on what's happened with those. Um, so I think cutting down on the option and making it easier for people to see what the current status is with the content that they're trying to register is is just going to be um, is going to be really helpful in um, in helping people yeah just participate in the services and not have to kind of to to, to guess and hope that what they're selecting is the right option. Yeah. Okay. I see that there is a participant raising. Her hand, Amelia. Yes, I can. I can allow Amelia to talk if she wants to say her question. Yeah, yeah. great. Please, Amelia, are you there? Hello, uh, Amelia. It might be that she has raised her hand by mistake, uh, in which case, okay. no problem. <laughs> sometimes okay. sometimes that happens. Uh, Amelia, if you do have a question, please uh, write it in the Q&A and we can answer that. Um, I think, um, yeah, um, just to also mention, um, in, in addition to what Rachel was just saying about OJS, um, we will be having another um, seminar tomorrow in which we will cover content registration in more detail. And part of that will be, we have a recording from PKP and they will be showing us how to use the OJS um, content registration tool. Um, so obviously, hopefully when there is a new version of it, we will have an updated recording. Um, they hoped to be able to join tomorrow, but unfortunately due to the time zone difference and um, they're not able to, but we will play the recording um, tomorrow.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if the, there are no more questions, so we can, yeah, we can finish this meeting, this. Okay, there is no more. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa and Rachel from Crossref, and thank you, Bu Lydia from Relawan Journal Indonesia, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, participants, uh, for joining this webinar. And <clears throat> good afternoon, Indonesia, and good morning, UK time. See you tomorrow. Good afternoon mm -hmm. again. <laughs> mm -hmm.